Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's long range US focused forecast video brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. This analysis is being provided for perspective only, and any decision made based upon this presentation is the sole responsibility of the person making the decision. Finally, please remember that long range weather forecasting is speculative by nature. I know I say that this forecast is primarily focused on the US, but I want to take you quickly to South America. Please remember that it is July the 3rd here, uh, and so we are in winter in South America, but we have uh, so much colder than normal weather moving through Argentina and southern Brazil. And so remember, we're still in harvest uh, down here. And so we've got some pretty cold temperatures. And as I press play, some of these cold anomalies are actually bringing uh, uh, freezing temperatures pretty far to the north, maybe as far north as this line I just drew in through here. Uh, so we've got some below zero temperatures coming into that area. Now, I'm not 100% sure as to what this is going to do to any sort of um, harvest efforts or crops that are still maturing. But it's something at least to note here that in the near term, if I just step you back here, you do see some very cold air, much colder than normal, sneaking through a big section of parts of Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, and southern Brazil. So something just to note, just keep an eye out on. As we look uh, elsewhere around the world real quick, I'm going to show you some data that came out from the European uh, center here, and it's showing what uh, Europe looked like in terms of June temperature anomalies. And currently, uh, that heat wave that came through there uh, at the middle, second half of June is right now got June as the warmest June on record. So that's uh, that's pretty impressive to see how warm things have been. Speaking of Europe, I'm just going to take you through the end of this week. We do have a pretty highly amplified pattern that's going to feature a broader trough still sitting here over much of northern Europe. And then, of course, um, the kind of the Scandinavian region and then, and then western Russia. So I'm expecting very active weather in terms of precipitation inside that circle. But you can see that Parts of France, parts of Spain, and southern parts of Germany are going to go back over to their warmer pattern here temporarily. Uh, this is not the same magnitude of a heat wave that we saw recently, but it's at least one to point out. And very quickly here, just before we get back to the United States, I want to show you that through the next 10 days, there is kind of a, a drier pocket that's showing up right in through here. Again, that very highly amplified pattern cutting through just like this. So much more rain here north of the Russian wheat belt. But look, here's the Black Sea. Let's just make sure we can see this. We can see that a, a big section of eastern Ukraine getting quite a bit of precipitation, and this moves into parts of the Russian wheat belt. So a lot of that rain's not coming uh, for several more days, but when we look out at the longer term forecast here, the next 10 days, we're seeing it. So that's at least something that might be impacting markets in the United States. Well, let's come back to precip here in the US. We covered this quite a bit in our forecast on Monday and also in the forecast information that came out regionally on Tuesday. But we do know that we're going to be seeing quite a bit of northwest flow coming in like this uh, over the coming days here. So a lot of thunderstorm activity rolling off the high plains here, moving through the middle section of the country. A, a model difference here that I'm starting to pick up on between the European model and the GFS is the way that they're handling the heavier precipitation down here across parts of the southeast. Big differences here between the European model and the GFS with what we're expecting to see in this corridor. GFS, again, is over there on the right. Uh, so when we look at where that moisture is coming from out of the out of the Gulf of, um, of Mexico, remembering that we will be having a very large dominant high pressure system spinning in this direction, um, I'm tending to favor the wetter pattern that the European model is picking up on here. Remember, it is summertime and the south it pops every day with thunderstorms. So we're going to continue to see that particular full pattern setting up. Now, the Gulf of Mexico is going to be supplying quite a bit of moisture, at least for the next several days. There might be a couple of times in here where we get some brief, you know, cool down and, 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 and drier weather here. But you're looking at a map, and I'm going to animate this for you, showing you precipitable water. Now, when you look at this map, the warmer colors indicate higher than average or above normal precipitable water, which is the amount of moisture the atmosphere has to precipitate. And the cooler colors are drier than normal. So you can see Gulf of Mexico moisture just really pumping, you know, into the midsection of the country which is what the atmosphere is going to be using to produce a lot of uh, thunderstorms and squallings over the coming days. Uh, you can also see here, I just got you out to Friday here, uh, really, I guess this is midnight. So 4th of July, that evening, boy, it's going to be a hot and humid one across this section of the country. By the way, this is uh, a barber over here and the moisture contained within that hurricane, powerful hurricane we'll talk more about in a minute. You can see that uh, we are going to see a bit of a flow uh, pattern change once we get out past the 9th and 10th. Uh, by the way, 7th and 8th in the northeast, nice uh, uh, dry down here, feel very, very pleasant during that time period. But the moisture really resurges for the next several days back up in the midsection of the country. So that's where we're going to see quite a bit of thunderstorm activity there. But look at what happens when I get you all the way out here to Saturday the 13th. At this point, 
we see quite a bit of moisture running up here along the west coast of the United States compared to average and some drier air. In fact, it pushes down here pretty far with time. And that is the signal for the overall pattern change we need to discuss. And we've kind of hinted at it several times in our recent video work, but we need to see what it's going to be doing, especially to maps like this. So here we are. I told you we'll talk about this every long range forecast. This is the um, growing degree day anomalies from June 1st until the current day. OK, so from June 1st, well, really until yesterday. And uh, remember, we just had a lot of folks in the midsection of the country planting the crop very late. Uh, around the 1st of June. So we're trying to see how since then we're accumulating growing degree day units. Now, because of the recent heat that we've had across the midsection of the country, and across parts of the Corn Belt, we have now picked up a very, very slight positive bias since June 1st. Now, this is nothing like we saw last June, where we were so warm and really picked up a, a lot of heat. Uh, but we are at least in positive territory. Now, there's some exception. You can see some pockets there in parts of Wisconsin and Michigan and also Indiana, Ohio and parts of Illinois. But much of the Northern Plains has uh, picked up some additional heat, which is going to be good. Um, outside of that, a lot of cloud cover and some cooler conditions and a lot of rain and through this area, a lot of thunderstorms keeping it there. But we, we know that down here along the Gulf Coast, remember, they were way ahead of average before June 1st, but they've stayed above average here. And the West Coast had some pretty good heat at times in June, especially early June, that's kept them uh, well above average here. But let's take you over to this figure. Now, I know this is a little bit challenging. I got to think of a better way to show this here. But what we're looking at here is growing degree day units we've had since June 1st. So we're adding them all up. And I want you to see that this color right in through here is about 700. Now, remember, uh, if we did plant you know, the normal variety, 110 day corn, let's just use that as, a, as an example. We need to get to about 1200 to 1300 growing degree day units for pollination to begin. And normally it's, you know, the third of July, I'm talking about pollination, but right now you can see that color broad section of the country in through here. I just kind of broadly outlined it where we're sitting, you know, somewhere around 60% of the, of the growing degree day units we would want for that crop planted on June 1st. So again, this is looking specifically at June 1st which tells me that if you did plant right around the end of May and the beginning of June, we're still looking at another three weeks, maybe more of warmth uh, to, to get us toward pollination. So it's, it's, it's something we all know, but just want to show it to you in the data here. So are we going to be getting any more, you know, heat? I want to take you first right out to uh, day five in the forecast time period. So this is out to July the 8th. And I want to show you, we've got quite a bit of high latitude blocking going on here. A couple of big ridges, one sitting over between Alaska and Russia, the other one sitting between Greenland and, and Scandinavia. And that's made for quite a bit of northern hemisphere troughing that's moved pretty far south. Now, what I'm talking about here is this trough here, this trough here, and that trough there. And what's going on is because of the position of these two ridges, I'll just kind of fill them in here. We are going to be developing with time uh, by, you know, here by the 8th, a west coast trough and a still pretty sizable ridge across the midsection of the country, which is going to allow that region, this region right in through here to kind of hang on to some warmer bias. But again, northwest flow, lots of thunderstorm activity in the coming days. So we, we've got that pinned down. Now, what about when we get up to the 13th? And we've been kind of talking about this for a while, but this is the 13th of July. We start to see much more broader troughing here across the open Pacific Ocean and a ridge building here along the west coast. And because of that, look at the trough we kind of dive into here between the, uh, the Great Lakes and the Hudson Bay. Again, let's take that drawing off there. A lot of northwest flow, which is why we continue to see with that northwest flow, a lot of thunderstorm activity pulling right into that Gulf of Mexico moisture. Northwest flow this time of year keeps our temperatures cool and it keeps things quite stormy. Normally, if we planted this crop back in April and early May, we would absolutely love this pattern in the midsection of the country. This would send our yields through the roof because it would be perfect. But it's not a normal year because of how wet things were to start off. And if I take you all the way out to the 18th of July, this is the day 15 forecast, we still see that similar pattern with that trough sitting in through here. Now, what does that mean in terms of temperatures? Well, days one through five are over here on the left. Remember, at this particular point, we're still seeing a flow pattern like this. So you can still see quite a bit of warmth building in this area uh, days one through five. Uh, as we look out here to days six through ten, very similar story. Uh, we don't see too much of a major cool down. But look at this. By the time we get up to day 15 and that trough becomes established, the warmth is confined to this section here. And the cool down begins in the midsection of the country. And we see that in both 
of our longer range models here. Okay, so very, very similar story being painted in terms of where the temperature anomalies are going to be by the time we get toward mid month. Now, I've been hearing a lot of discussion. I get asked this question a lot. You know, for the folks that did plant the crop very late, we're very worried about it being able to finish. So we have this concern about an early frost. We have this concern about will the crop get enough heat late in the season to, to get where it needs to get enough sunlight. You know, these are all the questions we have. And I'm going to make this statement. Can we really say much at this point about October and November? Are there any clues? Let me give you the best I've got right now. We can watch what's going on with El Nino. That's one of our better long range predictors. There are others, but this is gonna be the more dominant one as we press forward into fall. What's going on right now? Well, not a whole lot. The Southern Oscillation Index is actually trending back toward neutral. That's a near term effect, but it's one that tells us that El Nino's influence and El Nino La Nina, ENSO as we call it, its influence on, on uh, global weather patterns is minimized in the near term. We do see that sea surface temperature temperatures are cooling. Yes, you still see warm anomalies in this area, but the figure that you see up here in the upper right hand corner is actually telling us that right here in the midsection, we're starting to see with time from the end of May through June and early July, that those temperatures are cooling somewhat still positive, but they're cooling. Okay, that means we have some upwelling cooler water coming from below. And I'm just going to make this very, very clear. I brought it up in last week's forecast video. There's a very weak atmospheric connection right now with El Nino uh, and, and, and U.S. weather. And that's normal for summer. But at the same time, just remember that that particular feature has a low correlation with our summer weather. It's still a feature, but it's a low correlation. Where are we going with El Nino? Well, look at the model spread. It's actually quite enormous. Much of these models, when you average them, take us right back down here into neutral conditions, maybe a slight uh, uh, warm bias in, in terms of our ocean temperatures and therefore uh, an El Nino signature going into fall. But what does that even mean? Well, most time El Nino falls, look at this, El Nino falls, I'm talking primarily here about October, feature a flow pattern that is something a bit more like this. Now, that means if we hang on to this El Nino, in general, there is a weak correlation with more troughing here along the eastern part of North America and more ridging here along the western part of North America. So if there is an El Nino, we tend to get more ridging west and more troughing east, which actually means we kind of want El Nino to fade out of view. Uh, like I kind of said, it is a little bit. We want it to fade out of view if we'd like to keep a warmer fall. Well, what about any sort of a trend for fall? Well, we've seen this looking over the last 70 years. We just kind of look at how the atmosphere has been trending to go in fall. We've seen something a bit more like this, okay? Which means we've been getting warmth more often than not in the midsection of the country with some near average to cooler bias in parts there of the mid-south, but getting over toward the mid-Atlantic and in the north western part of the United States, which means longer term trends would actually tell us that fall is extending a bit in terms of its warm anomalies, which would be good. I need to show you this because I'm going to get brand new updates from this at the end of this week. So let's go back to last month. This is the forecast by the European model for October average temperatures and November. And what we see here is a little bit different from the longer term trend, but keeping it slightly cooler, slightly cooler than average in this corridor, but warm kind of around the periphery. By November, though, look, we've got warmer than average conditions being currently forecast. Now, again, that is probably following some of the longer term trends, but it's important to see these maps in this forecast video compared to next week's when we have brand new long range European model data. And we're going to see if they've trended warmer or colder for October. I want to make a very clear point right now. Anybody that's out there telling you that they know what's going to happen in October, November, and they're saying it with any sort of confidence is blowing smoke at you, okay? Because the signals are not clear and they, they typically never are in July to tell us what's going to be happening in early fall. We have to wait to see how the summer patterns emerge. So please, please, please remember that as you're watching other folks' long range forecasts, okay? What do we know? Well, we got just yesterday the long range, the 46 day European weekly updates, and they are showing this. I've got out here the 21st of July. So this is the basically the, that third week of July. We see the flow pattern broadly doing something like this. So in general, there's troughing in this area and a ridge building up the West Coast, which is why you see the warmth here in the near average to cooler than average weather across much of the eastern two thirds of the country. The southeast, you're going to continue to stay on your warmer bias, though. Let's go out another week. I've got you out here now to the last week of July. So you can see here this starts on August 1st. What do we have? We still see this pattern. See it there? And the ridge is running up in this direction. 
What does that give us? Near average to cooler than average temperatures inside that circle and warmth up the West Coast. These models have been very consistent with this pattern for July now for several weeks. So I'm tending to lean on them very heavily. What about taking you out to the 15th? So this would be looking at mid month in August. We still see that the general flow pattern is doing something like that, which means we aren't seeing anything that's saying that this ridge, which is over here, is going to be parked in the midsection of the country for a long time period, for a long time period. That's what I'm saying here. But remember, we're averaging a lot of forecast data to produce these maps, and they offer some guidance, but they're not truth, okay? They're just offering some guidance. But overall, I like to say, well, what do we not see? I don't see any reason to say that we're going to have sustained heat I'm talking 10 to 20 plus days across the Corn Belt this year as we progress through July and then into uh, into August. It's just not showing up yet in the cards. Um, we have to watch several things. The quasi biennial oscillation, where the Madden Julian oscillation goes. We have to watch if we do get some westerly wind bursts out in the Pacific Ocean or stronger easterlies. Both of those affect the Pacific jet stream. I watch them all and update you as often as I can about what's going on. But a lot of those features are short-term features when they affect the weather. Okay, so I want to quickly just tell you about what's going on in the tropics and we'll wrap this one up. The image that's over there on the left tells us that right now in the tropics, which we're looking right in this corridor, wherever you see those red colors, that indicates where we have above average wind shear throughout the depth of the atmosphere. Hurricanes can't handle that, which means we're seeing a suppression of our tropical you know, activity right now. Next, where most of our tropical activity is located is right now where we have these very low velocity potential values. Values. Now, what does that mean? Again, that just means where you see those cooler colors that the upper levels of the atmosphere are allowing for a lot of tropical convection, a lot of things to pop. And we're seeing that there and over the next week, still hanging out in the East Pacific where Barbara is right now. We do see that by the time we get maybe toward the middle and end of July, it is kind of slowly moving over into the Atlantic. But as it does, remember, it'll have to compete with wind shear. It'll have to compete with the dusty, dry air. And we're going to have to get something to trigger a tropical system. We just don't see that right now. Remember, this is where we currently sit in terms of our, our, our tropical season. We're just right here, which means we're moving as we get to the end of July and then into August and September toward the peak of our tropical season. So we're not even really there to where these wild cards, the tropical systems can start to play havoc. But we do have one right now. And there it is. That is Barbara. And Barbara was a powerful category four strength hurricane uh, moving across the East Pacific, not really impacting anyone. Hawaii is way out here. So this storm is just moving moving across this area, but look at all the tropical convection that is behind it. Uh, so this is where we're seeing a lot of the activity in the tropics right now. So I just want to keep you aware of those things. And uh, again, tomorrow morning, we'll have our brand new update uh, there on the 4th of July to kind of tell you what's going on in the next couple of weeks uh, locally here across the United States and other places around the world. But with that, I'm going to go and wrap up this forecast video. We at Nutrient Ag Solutions, thank you for your attention. We hope you look forward to all of our forecasts that come out at my.nutrientagsolutions.com. Have a great week. And if you don't get to watch my video tomorrow, please have a very safe and happy 4th of July. Thank you.